and the National Review's John Fund. Find a full schedule on your program guide or visit booktv.org. Now, from Freedom Fest, libertarian author and attorney Carla Garrick discusses her political point of view and the Free State Project. Carla Garrick is the author of this book, The Ecstatic Pessimist, Stories of Hope Mostly. Carla Garrick, I'm going to ask you a question I have never asked an author before. What was okay. I reading? <laughs> what was I reading? What was well, you were reading a collection of uh, my essays and short stories over time. It was sort of an amalgamation of the work I did when I did my MFA in City College in New York. So those were award-winning short stories. And then there was a lot of political polemic, I guess, in there. Uh, a lot of essays and blog posts and opinion pieces that I've written over the years, mostly in my role uh, with the Free State Project. Uh, what is the Free State Project? So the Free State Project is a libertarian movement. We're trying to attract libertarians to the state of New Hampshire. It's a mass, migra mass migration movement. So really what we're trying to do, and we've been around since 2003, and our success stories are really piling up at this stage. But what we did is in 2001, uh, this gentleman, Jason Sorens, he was a Yale student at the time, wrote a essay and he was like, what would happen if we put all libertarians in one geographic area? You know, the problem is there are a lot of people who actually believe in freedom and the principles of freedom, but they're scattered all over America or frankly, all over the world. And so he had this notion, if we sort of concentrated together in one spot, then maybe we would be able to make actual differences and actually achieve liberty in our lifetime. So I read about it back in like 2003. I started going to New Hampshire to sort of check out the scene. And in 2005, when I finished my MFA uh, at City College, I actually decided my husband and I were like, let's move to New Hampshire. Let's see what this is about. So we moved out and uh, the rest, as they say, is history, which you can read about in my book. <laughs> What's the experience been like living in New Hampshire as part of this project? So, I mean, it's interesting. I'm an immigrant. I grew up in South Africa. I grew up actually in South Africa during the apartheid era, and that is something I do cover in the book. There are several, you know, creative nonfiction pieces that are actually based on my life. So they have to do with going to boarding school, you know, sort of being abandoned as a little one. And, um, and then, you know, moving to the States, really moving for this principle of liberty. I had won a green card in the green card lottery back in the uh, mid 90s. I was in law school at the time, so I finished my law degree. And, um, and so I always had this notion that I wanted to come to America, come to this country. And so, you know, we went to San Francisco and then we went to New York City. And then, you know, because of my experience having grown up in South Africa in a, you know, it was a, it was a nationalist totalitarian police state. So that really informed the way I look at what the role between us and the government should be. And after 9-11, I feel like America started going on a really dark path. And so being solution driven, I was like, what's out there that forms a solution? And so New Hampshire offered it. So, you know, New Hampshire is not for everyone, but I do have jokingly say, you know, people are like, oh, it's so cold. And I'm like, well, still warmer than Mars. <laughs> Carla Garrick, what was it like to grow up in South Africa being part of a minority, being part of this apartheid system? Did it, did it, was it normal to you at the time? No, so, so, you know, I have a very unique background. My dad did work for the apartheid regime. I mean, that's cr a cross I'm gonna have to bear. But, uh, you know, we, we weren't uh, raised in a, a, in a racist environment or anything. You know, I was raised in a diplomatic home. So I actually traveled a lot as a child. So I always had this sort of uh, comparison, I guess, between what life was like in South Africa, which was extremely controlled. Uh, you know, the, the nationalist government, especially, you know, I, I was sort of growing up towards the tail end of apartheid. And so the national government was sort of clinging to their power. We saw a lot of what we're seeing now in America in terms of uh, mass censorship. 
uh, telling people there's only you know one, one story or one answer, really trying to sort of suppress any kind of alternate views. Yeah. Now, I actually was an anti-apartheid activist. I wasn't like famous or you know did any of that kind of stuff. But you know, I did go to marches. I worked with SDS when I was doing my law degree at the University of Pretoria. I taught black students. When I got my law degree, I was one of the few lawyers who would actually go into the townships and represent uh, represent you know defendants uh, as a legal aid case. So I would go in and do that. Uh, and in fact, one of the essays sort of talks about that and how you know I could do that until unfortunately Amy Beale got murdered. You know, and then people were like, it's not safe. You're not allowed to go do that. Don't go do that. And a lot of those cases were actually also drug war related, which I think is an interesting parallel to life in America. You know, one of the essays in the book does talk about how uh, I, I think, you know, black people in America actually are worse off than they even were under apartheid. And I don't say that lightly, but you know, in America, we have the largest incarcerated population in the world. And the war on drugs has been an abject failure and that it's really disproportionately affected our black communities. And so in some ways, it's ironic to see this extension of the work I did in South Africa to actually coming to America and being like, oh no, now we gotta do it all over again. But I mean, that's the reality. So, you know, it was a, it was a closed society. It was strange, but because I had lived in different places, I also knew that there, there was a better future out there. There was really something that, you know, was worth striving for. And of course, you know, Nelson Mandela was released in 94. I actually voted for him in the first open election. I and my husband and a couple of our friends were a handful of the white people who actually went to Nelson Mandela's inauguration. Uh, I remember CNN was out there with a film crew. I would love to track down that footage one day. Uh, you know, so, so I think South Africa actually informed the person I became. You know, people always ask, how did you become a libertarian? And I'm like, I think we're all pretty much born libertarian and then we get influenced or, you know, forced into some kind of thing. But really for me, it's just always been individualism and then really trying to help the community, but from an individualistic bottom up way and not from a top down way. And so, with, uh, you know, with, with life in South Africa, again, you know, we saw the censorship. Words in newspapers were banned. You know, they weren't allowed to talk about the, the, uh, the uh, certain words or the illegal border wars that were going on. We had national conscription. So a lot of my friends were actually forced into the military who didn't want to be there and they were harmed and traumatized by that experience. So really, you know, Again, I mean, sad to say, but I think that, you know, that, that, that experience in South Africa and sort of knowing what the tells are from, you know, the regime saying that these certain people were going to label as either terrorists or as, you know, extremists. And I've been called all those things. And frankly, I may be the only African American, you know, anti apartheid activist who voted for Nelson Mandela, who is now frequently called a white supremacist. So, I mean, that's where we are in America. So I think that's a move to try and silence voices that are actually genuinely trying to fix the problems. Carla Garrick in The Ecstatic Pessimist, a, a couple of times in a couple of the essays, the Fourth Amendment appears. Yes. So, well, uh, you know, illegal search and seizure. <laughs> why do you write about that? Why is that important to you? You know, I think a sense of privacy is uh, is important. I think that that is something that's sort of the locus of who we are, right? So one of the things I always look at is where is someone's focus of their locus? Like where do where are they kind of coming from? Is it from a I'm a person and this is me kind of thing? Or as you know, are you kumbaya and you're just part of the community or how is it, right? So I look at it from a, a personal thing. So the sense of privacy or the sense of yourself, and Edward Snowden talks about this as well, is that sense of privacy is actually the opportunity for us to figure out who we are, right? So, so we have this notion suddenly with this cancel culture and with all this uh, you know, craziness, frankly, that we're seeing where people are saying, You're n you have to be a fully formed human and you have to be perfect from the start. But really what 
privacy gives you is the opportunity to explore who are you and to be wrong. You know, like some people actually start one way and they end somewhere else. And so with the government starting to surveil us in this active way, I mean, we all know that in the past week, the government, like, shockingly, and I'm shocked that the legacy media isn't talking about this more, came out and said, we are going to monitor not only your posts, now someone like me, I mean, I'm shadow banned, you know, it's hard to get my message out there, uh, for no other reason than I think it's a threat to the regime or to the establishment that people are saying, you know what, we don't want to live in some kind of totalitarian, in this case, I mean, we're moving towards a sort of totalitarian uh, health uh, regime. I don't know. You know, it's not the play I expected. But again, you know, so the surveillance is a huge issue, I think. And so they're talking about not just looking at your public stuff, but actually starting. The American government has said categorically in a press conference that they are going to monitor your private messages and they are going to censor them if they don't like what you're saying. And to me, that is so shocking. And someone like me, as you can see in the book, you know, I've been writing about these issues since 2008. I've been thinking about these issues a really long time. And, you know, you don't want to be the Cassandra who's like, ah, told you so. But frankly, I'm here to say, told you so. We have been, you know, libertarians, have, we were the vanguard on the police accountability work. We were the, you know, no one, no one will give us the credit. You know, everyone's like BLM. And, you know, I do interviews all the time. And the Christian Science Monitor was like, oh, isn't it interesting that, you know, uh, libertarians and BLM kind of have the same issue. And I was like, but, you know, to give us credit, libertarians were the ones who said same-sex marriage should happen. We were the ones that said the drug war was a problem. We were the ones that said there is actually an issue with racism or with police brutality within the black communities. And, you know, no one listened to us for 15 years. And now suddenly it's de jure and people are talking about it. So the surveillance issues have been coming for a long time. Uh, you know, one of the essays in the book is about uh, pro-tour protest that we did in New Hampshire. It was a small town in New Hampshire. Hampshire, and they ran an open tour, which is the Onion Network. And basically what it does is it allows you to secretly or anonymously surf the internet. It's used by dissidents in suppressive re regimes. Uh, I might argue that, you know, it's now being used by activists in America because we actually need a channel in order to do these things. And uh, at this protest, which was, I mean, it was a sight to behold because we had you know, librarians, 80 year old librarians, retired librarians from Vermont had driven down and we had, you know, people from all over the state saying, no, the Department of Homeland Security doesn't have the right to come into a small library in a town in New Hampshire and shut down this tool that they've created that people use in order to be able to anonymously search for things. It is none of the government's business, what we read, what we're interested in, and what we're doing. And it is deeply, deeply problematic that we are moving in this direction and that there are not enough people who are in the mainstream speaking out against this because this is a giant, giant issue. We are moving in entirely the wrong direction. And, you know, and I hope people will read the book and understand that there are a lot of voices out here, not just mine. I mean, there are a lot of smarter people with way better books of course but they you know we've been we've been sort of saying hey guys hey guys we see these things coming and I think to anyone who went through 2020 it is frankly undeniable that we are right that we are calling out what the problems are and that we also have the solutions which of course I think partly the free state project offers right sort of the safe haven where we can get people together and where we can build a community of people who are like-minded, who are liberty forward, who have values that say, you know, we believe in individualism. We're actually excited when we don't agree on things that this whole notion that we've moved towards in this country where it's like, oh, we all have to lockstep, think this one thing. And if you don't, then you're the out class. It's, it's crazy. I mean, it's just not how the world should work. We Car should celebrate our uniqueness. Carla Garrick, you said that you were shadow banned. What does that mean? So on 
uh, Facebook and you know various media platforms, they will uh, they will basically you know put you on some kind of list, and depending on the kinds of things that you post, they will uh, either force your uh, your audience down so people just don't see your stuff in their news feed. You know, certain people have been deplatformed. Um, I certainly am not one of them. Someone like Naomi Wolf, who is speaking here this weekend, who we had out at the Porcupine Freedom Festival last month, you know, she was deplatformed from Twitter simply for raising questions about this lockdown situation. So basically, shadow ban means your reach gets smaller and smaller. It's a very insidious and very smart way to do things because it's hard to prove. Uh, the only way you can really see if it's happening is, um, you know, if you know, oh, I used to post this and it would get 500 likes and now I post it and it gets 40. Um, another example would be I do a lot of, you know, I was an outspoken critic of the lockdowns. I'm an outspoken critic about the mass mandates. I think we could simply have done it as we, you know, see in countries like Asia where if someone's sick, they wear a mask and if they're not, they're not. We didn't have to make it this huge political issue. but. Basically, anything I post now gets a COVID warning on it. I think I posted a photo of like this interview or something, and someone said, why does this have a COVID warning on it? You know, and I was like, I think they just put one on everything I post now. Who knows, right? So, so it's an insidious way to silence voices that are speaking out as dissidents at this stage against the regime. I want to ask about some of the people who pop up in the ecstatic pessimist. Lewis. Uh, my husband, Louis, yes. <laughs> uh, so we met in South Africa. We were actually dating when I won the green card. And so we moved out to, uh, to California together. He's a tech nerd. Uh, that's how I like him. And, uh, you know, we came out. He had a startup. I worked as an in-house counsel at uh, Fortune 500 companies. I worked at Apple Computer when uh, Steve Jobs came back from uh, Next back to Apple, uh, Borland, you know, and Logitech. And so we were sort of in that tech bubble. So he's my husband. I love him dearly. And uh, I wish he was here with me, but he's at home holding down the fort with the dog. And in addition to working at Apple, According to her bio, Carla Garrick has been a hair model, waitress, fiberglass chair maker, playwright, college lecture magazine editor, nonprofit director, and high-tech lawyer, has a master's degree and a law degree. Another one of the essays in the ecstatic pessimist Carla Garrick is about the 420 rally. What was that? Yeah, so that uh, that was one of those situations where, you know, never say never. Some poor kid who was a college student was covering the Free State Project. And he was like, oh, you guys are doing this rally after uh, Liberty Forum, which is our winter signature event for the Free State Project. He was like, could I come with? And then he was like, I'm kind of nervous. I don't know. Will there be trouble? And I was like, no, there won't be trouble. It'll all be fine. So famous last words. Um, so basically what happened was we did a 420 rally, which is a pro cannabis rally. Um, it was a beautiful spring day in Nashua, New Hampshire. And we had probably about a hundred people there and uh, people are just having a good time. People smoking weed, people were playing guitars, you know, it was just peaceful and beautiful and happy and just human beings, you know, being human. And, uh, where, you know, everyone's hanging out in the next second, these like two narcs just pop out and they kind of pulled their badges out of their shirt and they uh, go and arrest literally one of two black kids at the rally. And we were all like, what is happening? Like, this seems crazy. There are 60, 70, 80 people smoking weed and you're gonna arrest that one kid. So they did, they claimed that they'd been watching him for a while and that there was an outstanding warrant and all of that. But basically because that happened, the situation just, uh, you know, it escalated really fast. And I will say this, uh, you know, I've gone to a lot of protests and rallies and marches and things in my life. And, you know, things can turn on a dime. And we saw in that situation immediately when it was happening, you know, suddenly people were very angry and they were sort of, you know, chanting, um, you know, uh, uh, unfavorable police slogans, we'll leave it at that. Um, and, you know, immediately I was like, no, I think we need to shift this to no victim, no crime, right? That is something that resonates with most people. 
So as the arrest was happening, there were several activists who sat in front of the police car. Uh, you know, everyone sort of encircled the situation. I think something that made it quite dramatic and, and slightly dangerous or slightly interesting is Culturally in New Hampshire, a lot of people carry firearms. Uh, you can legally, we do have constitutional carry. A lot of our folks carry guns. Uh, they might open carry, they might conceal carry. And so when, when the police realized they were being surrounded, they of course called for backup. So next second, we've got 11 squad cars coming in. Now the cops are popping out, the people are angry. It's kind of getting really feisty, right? And I remember, and it's actually on a video on YouTube, there's an officer who kind of goes, he's got a gun. And then someone yells from our side, it's like, we all have guns, what now? And it was very interesting because what you realized is the police stood down in terms of the level of violence they were willing to bring to the situation. So when we talk about gun rights, you know, and for, you know, Second Amendment rights, that's part of it, right? That's part of that leveling of the playing field, right? So so people, and, and certainly I come from the progressive left. So I have a lot of friends who, you know, are just like, Carla, I don't know about half the things you think about, right? But that's one of the things with gun rights that we know it levels the playing field. And so it changed the energy at that protest that day. The police kind of stood down. I mean, they were there, they were being firm, but you know, they had their police dogs, but there wasn't this mass sort of rounding up and arresting that I think would have happened had that not been the case. They then took this child who was a 17 year old boy to the police station. Several of our uh, community activists went to the police station. We raised money just by passing a hat in the foyer to, um, pay his bail, we called his parents, they came to get him. That kid was out there the next week, they did follow up protests for a while. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of fun stuff we get up to at, in the free state of New Hampshire. But of course, again, you know, the drug war is not a joke. I mean, this is something where we are taking peaceful people and we are incarcerating them. And not only that, you know, we are actually uh, creating an entire society that has this downstream problems. We've destroyed families, uh, you know, uh, single parent families we know statistically don't do as well. Uh, these people have a hard time finding a job afterwards. And this is for personal choices and personal nonviolent behavior. I mean, I would just love to see America, we see from a state's rights perspective that, you know, all the states have started to liberalize their laws in this direction. And, um, and I think that's great. I'm a big proponent of states' rights, of course, you know, that's why we're in New Hampshire. But, um, but you know, it was a nice little to the, to the federal government. And, um, and I hope we'll see more of that. So, uh, you know, that was, a, that was a great rally. That was a very dramatic, a very dramatic day. And to that poor college student who came to write the essay, I sincerely now deeply apologize. <laughs> well, Carla Garrick, with regard to the Free Straight State Project, do y'all live in the same neighborhood? Is it spread out? How, how does that work? So, so the project itself just says, let's come to New Hampshire. Uh, people live all over the state. I mean, one of the beautiful things about New Hampshire is it's, it's, it's a perfect tiny little country, and I would like to see it be that, right? So we've got a seacoast, we've got mountains, got a fairly big city of 120,000 people, Manchester, that's where I live. There are these quaint little towns everywhere, university towns, very like rural, you know, no one votes kind of towns. Uh, so it runs the gamut. And so people live according to, live where, it's their flavor, right? So the, the, the seacoast area is a little more expensive. That tends to attract, you know, more high-end families. Manchester used to be an industrial city. Um, so, you know, but it's very central. It's right next to the airport and it's an hour from Boston. So, you know, people live in different areas. Now, I personally bought a house five years ago on the west side of Manchester. We have a community club in that area. We probably have hundreds of free staters that happen to live there. Um, but, you know, there are more than 5,000 free staters across the state, and they really just live where they want. I've got friends who are off the grid. Uh, there was a big ice storm in 2008, 2009, and the power was out across the state for like 
up to 13 days. Mine was out for 11. And I remember stopping at my friend's farm, Bardo Farm in the Upper Valley. And they were like, oh, the power's out? What? You know, because they uh, they live off the grid. And so, you know, it's 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 got a little bit of something for everyone. So there is, depending on what people like, you can really find something that will appeal to you. You know, we have a huge homeschooling community, unschooling, a lot of those people like to be a little more in the country. Um, and again, then, you know, Boston's fairly nearby, Quebec, um, Montreal's not far away, uh, you know, once we can get over the Canadian border again. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so we're not in one geographic area, but we are uh, in one state, the state of New Hampshire. Where did you come up with the name for your book? You know, it's, it's from the opening uh, story, which is a short story called The Ecstatic Pessimist. It's about an alcoholic who sort of turns his life around. And, um, and so I just kind of, I think it felt like a little bit of a, a shedding. Uh, the, the last essay, which is called How to Change the Color of Your Aura, which I always feel like I need to tell people, I don't know if auras are real. I just really like the idea of the someone, some hippie I know came up to me and I had quit drinking. Uh, I changed my diet. I changed my lifestyle. I kind of went from being very angry about things to being very much more uh, solution driven and lifestyle driven and liberty as a lifestyle and really trying to be a good um, steward of, of the message and then also, you know, just aspirational for other people. And so the start is sort of the ecstatic pessimist and this guy's a little pessimistic and it is loosely based, I guess, on where I was at that time, although it's a male narrator and, you know, it's not me per se, but there's definitely parts of me in that short story. And then I think the arc of the book, you know, is all these essays, short stories, collections, flash pieces, all of that. Um, but then at the end of the book, you know, it, it sort of has this whole, I, I have this change. And I was thinking actually, you know, if it wasn't so expensive with books, I was like, oh, I should do A-B testing and I should change the cover and call it the ecstatic um, optimist because that's really more where I am now. But I think it was just a, a letting go of that. And so that was the, the, you know, the title story. And so I went with that and, uh, you know, I'm working on my next book. So uh, we'll see, maybe I have a chance to redeem myself then. <laughs> What's the next book about? Um, so it is about my court case. Uh, back in 2010, I actually got arrested for filming police officers during a late night traffic stop. And, um, you know, this people are always surprised, right? Uh, cell phones have become so ubiquitous and we all have cameras with us all the time. But this was 2010 and I still literally had a video camera on my console. It was my birthday present. I'd only had it for, you know, a month. And we got pulled over and the police officer was acting weird. And I was like, you know, I'm just gonna film this. Why not, right? Uh, and long story short, things escalated. I got arrested. Uh, they took me to the police station. They actually chained me to a pole for several hours. It was a very strange and dark experience in general, including actually being dragged behind the police station at three o'clock in the morning by like three cops who, you know, sort of held me up and were like, you're never going to see that camera again. So what happened was they confiscated the camera, but they wouldn't give me a receipt to prove they had taken it. And I was like, well, I'm not leaving the police station without that camera. And um, and they had charged me with, you know, the wholesale as they do disobeying an officer and those things where it's not really, you haven't really committed a crime. You just angered the authorities, you know? And so um, because I insisted on getting that receipt, they actually ended up uh, charging me with wiretapping, which is a seven year felony. And, um, and, you know, they, they, they picked the wrong lady, you know, not just my legal background, but that sort of rebel spirit that I have. I was just like, nope, I'm not going to let you guys get away with it. So the book really talks about the court case sort of in detail. You know, it's, it's, it's narrative. So it's definitely like, you know, it's a character and you're sort of going through it with her. But I'm incredibly proud of that 
lawsuit, um, it went all the way. They dropped their charges against me, and then I ended up suing them. It was an original 37 count for violations of my civil rights. Uh, it took four years as we were progressing over the time. Uh, you know, my lawyers were asking, what do you really care about? And I was like, I care about the First Amendment right to film public officials in the execution of their public duties. There is no rational reason why a police officer could claim that while he is in public, we as citizens of this country do not have the right to film them. And so, you know, it, uh, there was one preceding case, but I fought it all the way to the First Circuit that, of course, is out of Boston. It covers about 13 million million people. So 13 million people now definitely have the First Amendment right to film police officers in the execution of their duty. The other thing that was really important in this case is they did end up uh, saying it was a three-person panel of judges, and they did say police officers do not have qualified immunity to stop, you know, because here's the thing. Qualified immunity is this weird exception in American law, and it's, and it's a perversion of how it should work. And basically, when you and I are told ignorance of the law is no excuse, we've all heard that, right? So ignorance of the law is no excuse. But they argue ignorance of the law is no excuse unless you're an enforcer of the law, and then it's an absolute defense. Now, that is crazy, right? We can't hold our public officials to a lower standard than we're being held to. So they were literally arguing that, well, yeah, you have a constitutional right to film police officers in public during the day at the Boston Commons, which was the Glick case. So that was the preceding case. They were like, but we don't think you necessarily have the right to do it. Uh, on a dark road at night in March on a winter night in New Hampshire, right? And I mean, I actually said to, to the opposing counsel, I was like, so let me get this straight. You guys are straight faced trying to make an argument that uh, the Constitution doesn't apply after dark. And, you know, they laughed and they were like, ha, ha, ha. But so what the court found is they cannot claim qualified immunity. So if a police officer in America confiscates your camera, takes your footage, tries to stop you from filming something, and please don't get like in the middle of whatever is happening, right? You don't want to make a bad situation worse. But we do want to uh, pay witness, I guess, or bear witness to what is going on. One of the things I'm incredibly proud of is because of that case, part of the reason we are having the discussions today about police brutality, about police accountability, about all of the things that, you know, everyone is up in arms about and that, you know, uh, you know, cities have burned about. All of that is because for the first time in the history of mankind, we can prove the truth. We have footage to show the world that they are lying. I was, I mean, I was actually horrified, I guess is maybe the right word, in my own case and in my own experience to see the uh, like blatant lies and just unnecessary framing and, 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 uh, misconduct by the police. Amongst other things, they claimed in my police in the police report, which when I received it, I, you know, I started reading it and I actually laughed out loud because I was like, oh, this is ridiculous. I actually called my lawyer and I was like, are you guys just like, I don't know, did you send me like a fake report just to tease me or something? But no. So they claimed, amongst other things, that I parked my car in the middle of the road, jumped out, ran down the street, this is 11 o'clock at night, yelling, remember the clothes. And I was like, OK, first of all, I've never uttered those words, but I might call my book that. <laughs> um, they said that the uh, camera I was using, so they instructed me to, to, to I was following another car. So they told me, go, uh, I said, I'm gonna go park over there in the school and then film you from there. And I got out the car and I was filming and I said, I'm audio and video recording. So they were on notice, I was doing everything right. I'm a lawyer, so I kind of know what I'm supposed to be doing, right? And, um, and so they, they claimed that the video camera that I had uh, in the police report, they said there was a red light, a red laser-like light that made us think it was a scope, a, a laser scope on a firearm. 
So it turns out the brand of camera, which they confiscated and held for over a year, did not have any lights on it because it's the camera that people use when they bootleg stuff. It is actually designed not to have a light on it. So those kind of levels of lies in a police report, I mean, just really for me was, it was a wild wake up call because, you know, I, I'm an individualist and I'm not someone who believes every police officer is evil. I think at this stage, maybe the system itself, you know, needs deep reform. But because I believe in individualism, I have to believe that there are good police officers, just like they're bad ones, right? Just like everything with every form of human. But I have to tell you, I read that police report and it really, really, really opened my eyes to be like, wow, you know, there's a system and they can just wholesale make things up and really devastate people's lives. Now, again, you know, I feel like, hey, you picked on the wrong person and they didn't know it at the time, right? But then you have to think about all well, the other people they pick on who aren't like me, who aren't willing to fight back, who don't have the resources to say, oh, hell no. And so, you know, we know that there are just a lot of people who are being harmed with where we are now. Carla Garrick has run for the New Hampshire Senate for three times, getting 44% of the vote in 2020. And she is the author of this book, The Ecstatic Pessimist. Thanks for joining us on Book TV. Thank you so much for having me. This is a pleasure. Here's a look.